Section 1 of Dryden v. Shadwell, A Poetic Duel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Dryden v. Shadwell, A Poetic Duel. By John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell. Epistle to the Whigs. By John Dryden. For to whom can I dedicate this poem with so much justice as to you? It is the representation of your own hero. It is the picture drawn at length, which you admire and prize so much in little. None of your ornaments are wanting, neither the landscape of your tower, nor the rising sun, nor the anno domini of your new sovereign's coronation. This must needs be a grateful undertaking to your whole party, especially to those who have not been so happy as to purchase the original. I hear the graver has made a good market of it. All his kings are bought up already, or the value of the remainder so enhanced that many a poor Polander, who would be glad to worship the image, is not able to go to the cost of him, but must be content to see him here. I must confess I am no great artist, but signpost painting will serve the turn to remember a friend by, especially when better is not to be had. Yet for your comfort the lineaments are true and though he sat not five times to me as he did to be, yet I have consulted history, as the Italian painters do, when they would draw a Nero or a Caligula, though they have not seen the man, they can help their imagination by a statue of him, and find out the colouring from Suetonius and Tacitus. Truth is, you might have spared one side of your medal. The head would be seen to more advantage if it were placed on a spike of the tower, a little nearer to the sun, which would then break out to better purpose. You tell us in your preface to the no Protestant plot that you shall be forced hereafter to leave off your modesty. I suppose you mean that little which is left you, for it was worn to rags when you put out this metal. Never was there practised such a piece of notorious impudence in the face of an established government. I believe when he is dead you will wear him in thumb-rings, as the Turks did Skanderbeg, as if there were virtue in his bones to preserve you against monarchy. Yet all this while you pretend not only zeal for the public good, but a due veneration for the person of the king. But all men who can see an inch before them may easily detect those gross fallacies. That it is necessary for men in your circumstances to pretend both is granted you, for without them there could be no ground to raise a faction. But I would ask you one civil question. What right has any man among you, or any association of men, to come nearer to you, who, out of Parliament, cannot be considered in a public capacity to meet as you daily do in factious clubs, to vilify the government in your discourses, and to libel it in all your writings. Who made you judges in Israel? Or how is it consistent with your zeal for the public welfare to promote sedition? Does your definition of loyal, which is to serve the king according to the laws, allow you the license of traducing the executive power with which you own he is invested? You complain that his majesty has lost the love and confidence of his people, and by your very urging it you endeavour what in you lies to make him lose them. All good subjects abhor the thought of arbitrary power, whether it be in one or many. If you were the patriots you would seem, you would not at this rate incense the multitude to assume it, for no sober man can fear it, either from the king's disposition or his practice, or even, where you would odiously lay it, from his ministers. Give us leave to enjoy the government and the benefit of laws under which we were born, and which we desire to transmit to our posterity. You are not the trustees of the public liberty, and if you have not right to petition in a crowd, much less have you to intermeddle in the management of affairs, or to arraign what you do not like, which in effect is everything that is done by the king and council. Can you imagine that any reasonable man will believe you respect the person of his majesty, when it is apparent that your seditious pamphlets are stuffed with particular reflections on him? If you have the confidence to deny this, it is easy to be evinced from a thousand passages, which I only forbear to quote, because I desire that they should die and be forgotten. I have perused many of your papers, and to show you that I have, the third part of your no-Protestant plot, 
is much of it stolen from your dead author's pamphlet called the growth of popery as manifestly as milton's defence of the english people is from buchanan's de jure regni apud scotos or from your covenant and new association from the holy league of the french geysards any one who reads davila may trace your practices all along there were the same pretences for reformation and loyalty the same aspersions of the king and the same grounds of a rebellion i know not whether you will take the historian's word who says it was reported that paul trot a huguenot murdered francis duke of guise by the instigations of theodore beza or that it was a huguenot minister otherwise called a presbyterian for our church abhors so devilish a tenet who first writ a treatise of the lawfulness of deposing and murdering kings of a different persuasion in religion but i am able to prove from the doctrine of calvin and principles of buchanan that they set the people above the magistrate which if i mistake not is your own fundamental and which carries your loyalty no further than your liking when a vote of the house of commons goes on your side you are as ready to observe it as if it were passed into a law but when you are pinched with any former and yet unrepealed act of parliament you declare that in some cases you will not be obliged by it the passage is in the same third part of the no protestant plot and is too plain to be denied the late copy of your intended association you neither wholly justify nor condemn but as the papists when they are unopposed fly out into all the pageantries of worship but in times of war when they are hard pressed by arguments lie close entrenched behind the council of trent so now when your affairs are in a low condition you dare not pretend that to be a legal combination but whensoever you are afloat i doubt not but it will be maintained and justified to purpose for indeed there is nothing to defend it but the sword it is the proper time to say anything when men have all things in their power in the meantime you would fain be nibbling at a parallel betwixt this association and that in the time of queen elizabeth but there is this small difference betwixt them that the ends of one are directly opposite to the other one with the queen's approbation and conjunction as head of it the other without either the consent or knowledge of the king against whose authority it is manifestly designed therefore you do well to have recourse to your last evasion that it was contrived by your enemies and shuffled into the papers that were seized which yet you see the nation is not so easy to believe as your own jury but the matter is not difficult to find twelve men in newgate who would acquit a malefactor i have only one favour to desire of you at parting that when you think of answering this poem you would employ the same pens against it who have combated with so much success against absalom and achitophel for then you may assure yourselves of a clear victory without the least reply rail at me abundantly and not to break a custom do it without wit by this method you will gain a considerable point which is wholly to waive the answer of my arguments never own the bottom of your principles for fear they should be treason fall severely on the miscarriages of government for if scandal be not allowed you are no free-born subjects if god has not blessed you with the talent of rhyming make use of my poor stock and welcome let your verses run upon my feet and for the utmost refuge of notorious blockheads reduced to the last extremity of sense turn my own lines upon me and in utter despair of your own satire make me satirize myself some of you have been driven to this bay already but above all the rest commend me to the nonconformist parson who writ the whip and key i am afraid it is not read so much as the piece deserves because the bookkeeper is every week crying help at the end of his gazette to get it off you see i am charitable enough to do him a kindness that it may be published as well as printed and that so much skill in hebrew derivations may not lie for waste paper in the shop yet i half suspect he went no further for his learning than the index of hebrew names and etymologies which is printed at the end of some english bibles if achitophel signifies the brother of a fool the author of that poem will pass with his readers for the next of kin and perhaps it is the relation that makes the kindness whatever the verses are 
buy them up i beseech you out of pity for i hear the conventicle is shut up and the brother of Achitophel out of service now footmen you know have the generosity to make a purse for a member of their society who has had his livery pulled over his ears and even protestant socks are brought up among you out of veneration to the name a dissenter in poetry from sense and english will make as good a protestant rhymer as a dissenter from the church of england a protestant parson besides if you encourage a young beginner who knows but he may elevate his style a little above the vulgar epithets of profane and saucy jack and atheistic scribbler with which he treats me when the fit of enthusiasm is strong upon him by which well-mannered and charitable expressions i was certain of his sect before i knew his name what would you have more of a man he has damned me in your cause from genesis to revelations and has half the texts of both the testaments against me if you will be so civil to yourselves as to take him for your interpreter and not to take them for irish witnesses after all perhaps you will tell me that you retained him only for the opening of your cause and that your main lawyer is yet behind now if it so happen he meet with no more reply than his predecessors you may either conclude that I trust to the goodness of my cause, or fear my adversary, or disdain him, or what you please. For the short of it is, it is indifferent to your humble servant, whatever your party says or thinks of him. End of Epistle to the Whigs by John Dryden Recording by Bob Gonzalez Section 2 of Dryden v. Shadwell, A Poetic Duel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Dryden v. Shadwell, A Poetic Duel. By John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell. The Medal. By John Dryden. Of all our antic sights and pageantry, which English idiots run in crowds to see, the Polish medal bears the prize alone, a monster more the favorite of the town than either fairs or theatres have shown. Never did art so well with nature strive, nor ever idol seemed so much alive, so like the man, so golden to the sight, so base within, so counterfeit and light. One side is filled with title and with face, and, lest the king should want a regal place, on the reverse a tower the town surveys, o'er which our mounting sun his beams displays. The word, pronounced aloud by shrieval voice, Letamor, which in Polish is rejoice. The day, month, year to the great act are joined, and a new canting holiday designed. Five days he sate, for every cast and look, Four more than God to finish Adam took. But who can tell what essence angels are, Or how long heaven was making Lucifer? Oh, could the style that copied every grace, And ploughed such furrows for an eunuch face, Could it have formed his ever-changing will, The various piece had tired the graver's skill. A martial hero first, with early care, blown like a pygmy by the winds to war, a beardless chief, a rebel ere a man, so young his hatred to his prince began. Next this, how wildly will ambition steer, a vermin wriggling in the usurper's ear, bartering his venal wit for sums of gold, he cast himself into the saint-like mould, groaned, sighed, and prayed, while godliness was gain, the loudest bagpipe of the squeaking train. But as tis hard to cheat a juggler's eyes, his open lewdness he could ne'er disguise. There split the saint, for hypocritic zeal allows no sins but those it can conceal. Whoring to scandal gives too large a scope. Saints must not trade, but they may interlope. The ungodly principle was all the same, but a gross cheat betrays his partner's game. Besides, their pace was formal, grave, and slack. His nimble wit outran the heavy pack. Yet still he found his fortune at a stay, 
whole droves of blockheads choking up his way. They took but not rewarded his advice. Villain and wit exact a double price. Power was his aim, but thrown from that pretense, the wretch turned loyal in his own defense, and malice reconciled him to his prince. Him, in the anguish of his soul, he served, rewarded faster still than he deserved. Behold him now exalted into trust, his counsels oft convenient, seldom just. Even in the most sincere advice he gave, he had a grudging still to be a knave. The frauds he learned in his fanatic years made him uneasy in his lawful gears. At best, as little honest as he could, and like white witches, mischievously good. To his first bias longingly he leans, and rather would be great by wicked means. Thus framed for ill, he loosed our triple hold, advice unsafe, precipitous and bold. From hence those tears, that ilium of our woe, who helps a powerful friend for arms of foe. What wonder if the waves prevail so far, when he cut down the banks that made the bar? Seas follow but their nature to invade, but he by art our native strength betrayed. So Samson to his foe his force confessed, and, to be shorn, lay slumbering on her breast. But when this fatal counsel, found too late, exposed its author to the public hate, when his just sovereign by no impious way could be seduced to arbitrary sway, forsaken of that hope, he shifts his sail, drives down the current with a popular gale, and shows the fiend confessed without a veil. He preaches to the crowd that power is lent, but not conveyed to kingly government, that claims successive bear no binding force, that coronation oaths are things of course, maintains the multitude can never err, and sets the people in the papal chair. The reason's obvious, interest never lies, the most have still their interest in their eyes. The power is always theirs, and power is ever wise. Almighty crowd, thou shortenest all dispute. Power is thy essence, wit thy attribute. Nor faith nor reason make thee at a stay, thou leap'st o'er all eternal truths in thy Pindaric way. Athens, no doubt, did righteously decide when Phocion and when Socrates were tried. As righteously they did those dooms repent, still they were wise, whatever way they went. Crowds err not, though to both extremes they run, to kill the father and recall the son. Some think the fools were most as times went then, but now the world's o'erstocked with prudent men. The common cry is even religion's test. The Turks is at Constantinople best. Idols in India, popery at Rome, and our own worship only true at home. And true, but for the time, tis hard to know how long we please it shall continue so. This side to-day, and that to-morrow burns, so all are God Almighty's in their turns, a tempting doctrine, plausible and new. What fools our fathers were, if this be true, who, to destroy the seeds of civil war, inherent right in monarchs did declare, and, that a lawful power might never cease, secured succession to secure our peace. Thus property and sovereign sway, at last, in equal balances were justly cast. But this new Jehu spurs the hot-mouthed horse, instructs the beast to know his native force, to take the bit between his teeth and fly to the next headlong steep of anarchy. Too happy England, if our good we knew, would we possess the freedom we pursue. The lavish government can give no more. Yet we repine, and plenty makes us poor. God tried us once. Our rebel fathers fought. He glutted them with all the power they sought, till, mastered by their own usurping brave, the free-born subject sunk into a slave. We loathe our manna, 
and we long for quails ah what is man when his own wish prevails how rash how swift to plunge himself in ill proud of his power and boundless in his will that kings can do no wrong we must believe none can they do and must they all receive help heaven or sadly we shall see an hour when neither wrong nor right are in their power already they have lost their best defence the benefit of laws which they dispense no justice to their righteous cause allowed but baffled by an arbitrary crowd and metals graved their conquest to record the stamp and coin of their adopted lord the man who laughed but once to see an ass mumbling make the cross-grained thistles pass might laugh again to see a jury chaw the prickles of unpalatable law the witnesses that leech like lived on blood sucking for them was medicinally good but when they fastened on their festered sore then justice and religion they forswore their maiden oaths debauched into a whore thus men are raised by factions and decried and rogue and saint distinguished by their side they rack even scripture to confess their cause and plead a call to preach in spite of laws but that's no news to the poor injured page it has been used as ill in every age and is constrained with patience all to take for what defence can greek and hebrew make happy who can this talking trumpet seize they make it speak whatever sense they please Twas framed at first our oracle to inquire, but since our sects in prophecy grow higher, the text inspires not them, but they the text inspire. London, thou great emporium of our isle, O thou too bounteous, thou too fruitful Nile, how shall I praise or curse to thy desert, or separate thy sound from thy corrupted part? I call thee Nile, the parallel will stand thy tides of wealth o'erflow the fattened land yet monsters from thy large increase we find engendered on the slime thou leav'st behind sedition has not wholly seized on thee thy nobler parts are from infection free of israel's tribes thou hast a numerous band but still the canaanite is in the land thy military chiefs are brave and true nor are thy disenchanted burghers few the head is loyal which thy heart commands but what's a head with two such gouty hands the wise and wealthy love the surest way and are content to thrive and to obey but wisdom is to sloth too great a slave none are so busy as the fool and knave those let me curse what vengeance will they urge whose ordures neither plague nor fire can purge nor sharp experience can to duty bring nor angry heaven nor a forgiving king in gospel phrase their chapmen they betray their shops are dens the buyer is their prey the knack of trades is living on the spoil they boast even when each other they beguile customs to steal is such a trivial thing that tis their charter to defraud their king all hands unite of every jarring sect they cheat the country first and then infect they for god's cause their monarchs dare dethrone and they'll be sure to make his cause their own whether the plotting jesuit laid the plan of murdering kings or the french puritan our sacrilegious sects their guides outgo and kings and kingly power would murder too what means their traitorous combination less too plain to evade too shameful to confess but treason is not owned when tis descried successful crimes alone are justified the men who no conspiracy would find who doubts but had it taken they had joined joined in a mutual covenant of defence at first without at last against their prince if sovereign right by sovereign power they scan the same bold maxim holds in god and man god were not safe his thunder could they shun 
he should be forced to crown another son. Thus when the heir was from the vineyard thrown, the rich possession was the murderer's own. In vain to sophistry they have recourse, by proving there's no plot, they prove tis worse, unmasked rebellion and audacious force, which, though not actual, yet all eyes may see, tis working in the immediate power to be. For from pretended grievances they rise, first to dislike, and after to despise, then cyclop-like, in human flesh to deal, chop up a minister at every meal, perhaps not wholly to melt down the king, but clip his regal rights within the ring, from thence to assume the power of peace and war, and ease him by degrees of public care. Yet to consult his dignity and fame, he should have leave to exercise the name, and holds the cards, while commons played the game, for what can power give more than food and drink, to live at ease, and not be bound to think? These are the cooler methods of their crime, but their hot zealots think tis loss of time, on utmost bounds of loyalty they stand, and grin and whet like a Croatian band, that waits impatient for the last command. Thus outlaws open villainy maintain, they steal not, but in squadrons scour the plain, and if their power the passengers subdue, the most have right, the wrong is in the few. Such impious axioms foolishly they show, for in some soils republics will not grow, our temperate isle will no extremes sustain, of popular sway or arbitrary reign, but slides between them both into the best, secure in freedom, in a monarch blest. And though the climate, vexed with various winds, works through our yielding bodies on our minds, the wholesome tempest purges what it breeds, to recommend the calmness that succeeds. But thou, the pander of the people's hearts, O crooked soul and serpentine in arts, whose blandishments a loyal land have hoard, and broke the bonds she plighted to her lord, what curses on thy blasted name will fall, which age to age their legacy shall call, for all must curse the woes that must descend on all. Religion thou hast none, thy mercury has passed through every sect, or theirs through thee. But what thou givest, that venom still remains, and the poxed nation feels thee in their brains. What else inspires the tongues and swells the breasts of all thy bellowing renegado priests, that preach up thee for God, dispense thy laws, and with thy stum ferment their fainting cause? Fresh fumes of madness raise, and toil and sweat to make the formidable cripple great. Yet should thy crimes succeed, should lawless power compass those ends, thy greedy hopes devour, thy canting friends thy mortal foes would be, thy God and theirs will never long agree, for thine, if thou hast any, must be one that lets the world and humankind alone, a jolly God that passes ours too well to promise heaven, or threaten us with hell, that unconcerned can at rebellion sit and wink at crimes he did himself commit. A tyrant theirs, the heaven their priesthood paints, a conventicle of gloomy, sullen saints, a heaven like bedlam, slovenly and sad, foredoomed for souls with false religion mad. Without a vision, poets can foreshow what all but fools by common sense may know. If true succession from our isle should fail, and crowds profane with impious arms prevail, not thou, nor those thy factious arts engage, shall reap that harvest of rebellious rage, with which thou flatterest thy decrepit age, the swelling poison of the several sects, which wanting vent the nation's health infects, shall burst its bag, and fighting out their way, the various venoms on each other prey. The presbyter puffed up with spiritual pride, shall on the necks of the lewd nobles ride. His brethren damn, 
the civil power defy and parcel out republic prelacy but short shall be his reign his rigid yoke and tyrant power will puny sects provoke and frogs and toads and all the tadpole train will croak to heaven for help from this devouring crane the cutthroat sword and clamorous gown shall jar in sharing their ill-gotten spoils of war chiefs shall be grudged the part which they pretend lords envy lords and friends with every friend about their impious merit shall contend the surly commons shall respect deny and jostle peerage out with property their general either shall his trust betray and force the crowd to arbitrary sway or they suspecting his ambitious aim in hate of kings shall cast anew the frame and thrust out collatine that bore their name thus inborn broils the factions would engage or wars of exiled heirs or foreign rage till halting vengeance overtook our age and our wild labours wearied into rest reclined us on a rightful monarch's breast pudet hec opprobia vobis et disi potuisse et non potuisse refeli end of the medal by john dryden recording by bob gonzales section 3 of dryden versus shadwell this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug Dryden vs. Shadwell, A Poetic Duel by John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell Section 3 Epistle to the Tories by Thomas Shadwell We here present you with a medal of an heroic author which most properly belongs to you, he being at this time hired to lie and libel in your service, and in his last essay has performed it so dully that if you put him away, as it is said of the gentleman usher and the doctor in the rehearsal, nobody else will take him. No, nobody else will take him. We cannot say his portraiture is done at the full length, or has all its ornaments, since there are many touches to be added to it, which we shall reserve for the occasions he shall give us hereafter. But we dare say these rough strokes have made the lineaments and proportions so true that any one that knows him will find there is a great resemblance of him, and will believe that he has sat above five times for it, though indeed he is so liberal of showing himself that in an hour's space he will expose all his parts, and a good drawer in that time may observe enough to make a nudity of him. You may know he is no concealer of himself, by a story which he tells of himself, viz. that when he came first to town, being a young raw fellow of seven-and-twenty, as he called himself when he told the story, he frequenting but one coffee-house, the woman, it seems, finding him out, put coffee upon him for chocolate, and made him pay three pence a dish for two years together, till, at length, by what providence I know not, he discovered the cheat. This stupidity were incredible if he had not told it of himself publicly. But there is somewhat to be said for it, for, as he said of himself at the same time, the opening in his head, which in children usually closes about the age of three, did not close in him till he was seven and twenty, which may be the reason he has had such a devilly soft place there ever since. There are several witnesses that heard these things from him publicly. There are a multitude of notable sayings upon himself, which we may present you when he shall provoke us to show you his life at full length. This may give you some taste of his discretion and judgment, but you who have had his conversation know it is so lumpish and phlegmatic, or arrogant and silly, that he never pleases you with, or makes you merry at anything but his folly. As for ready wit, he carries very little or none about him, 
but if you draw a bill upon him like a banker he can answer you at home and as bankers do with the cash that is other men's whoever has been conversant with spanish italian french and classic authors will find all that's tolerably good in him in some of those he can indeed new trim and disguise a little the clothes he steals he has an easiness in rhyme and a knack at versifying, and can make a slight thing seem pretty and clinquant, and his forte is that he is an indifferent good versificator. If at any time he has wit of his own, tis in railing when the venom of his malice provokes his fancy. His panegyrics are full of such nauseous flattery that they are libels, and he has now become so infamous that his libels will be thought panegyrics his prostituted muse will become as common for hire as his mistress reversia was upon whom he spent so many hundred pounds and of whom to show his constancy in love he got three claps and she was aboard let all his own romantic plays show so true and so heroic a lover you who would know him better go to the coffee-house where he may be said almost to inhabit and you shall find him holding forth to half a score young fellows, who clap him on the back, spit in his mouth, and loo him upon the wigs, as they call them, puffed up and swelling with their praise, and the great subject of his discourse shall be of himself and his poetry, what art he uses for epic, what for comic, what curse he is in for libel, and what for tragedy. He has never been conversant in any science but poetry, philosophy of all sorts he has an aversion to having no rational or argumentative head but if he be anything he is a mere poet and from such an animal libera nos etc from a man of one busyness as the italian proverb says tis not two years since he consulted with an eminent and learned physician of this town telling him he was obliged to write a play and finding himself very dull desired he would prescribe him a diet and course of physic fit for his malady the doctor merrily asked him whether it was comedy or tragedy he designed he answered tragedy the doctor replied the steel diet was most proper for tragedy whereupon the poet desired to have it prescribed and did undergo it for six weeks before the writing of the medal he might e'en as properly have been prescribed the diet of brass for to use his own expression never was there practised such a notorious piece of impudence in the face of an established government as a villainous libelling so great a peer so instrumental in the restoring of the king who has so deservedly borne and so faithfully discharged such great offices in the state and who is still in spite of popish clamours and false witnesses ready upon all occasions to serve his majesty and the kingdom with the highest loyalty and integrity consider what stripes the varlet deserves for giving him these words in his libel monster base within counterfeit and light rebel vermin lewd villain wretch knave impious fiend jehu traitorous lays curses on his hated name nor can his gout scape him but he must be called formidable cripple the unpunished audaciousness of this frontless scribbler would be a reproach to any government and therefore no man can think him too hardly dealt with in the following medal especially since he knows and so do all his old acquaintance that there is not an untrue word spoken of him there is not so vile an employment as that of a hired libeller an executioner of men's reputations the hangman is an office of greater dignity were all which your poet says of this great peer true yet the libeller ought to be whipped out of a country for his insolence but what does he deserve when he himself knows every word of it to be false and scarce a papist in england believes anything of it to be true he is as unlucky in his allusion to the Turks wearing of Scanderbeg's bones as he is afterwards in his bungling simile about the feigned association. They were the Turks, Scanderbeg's enemies, that wore his bones, and therefore he thinks this lord's friends must do the same. 
according to the example which he cites you, Tories should do it, and I doubt not, but ye would be glad on't. But we hope ye will last, till by happy agreement of the King with a Parliament, your party will hide their heads, or become of no signification, which for that very reason ye endeavour all ye can to obstruct. I know not what good his bones might do ye were he dead, but I am sure his brains, while he is living, would be very much to the advantage of the best of ye. Those would keep ye from the ridiculous follies and mad extravagances ye daily run into. Tis you that are apparently the faction, since ye are the few that are divided from the many. Tis you who in your factious clubs vilify the government by audaciously railing against parliaments, so great and so essential a part of it. They ought to lose the use of speech who dare say anything irreverently of the king or disrespectfully of parliaments. If anything would make the king lose the love and confidence of his people, it would be your unpunished boldness who presume to call the freeholders of England the rabble and their representative a crowd, and strike at the very root of all their liberty. Ye are those who abuse our gracious prince, and endeavour to delude him with false numbers, and promising to serve him when ye have no interest, as in all the frequent parliaments. His Majesty has been pleased to promise us, will plainly appear. If anything could dishonour him, it would be the bloody violence of your spirits, your unpunished exorbitances, and breach of laws, your huzzaying, roaring, quarrelling, and damning by much the greater part of the nation and their whole representative body. Who made ye judges in Israel? But whatever ye might have been in Judea, ye will find very few of ye will be made in England, trustees for the liberty of the people, as your poet says, who, as if he had been hired for the whole popish plot, vilely cast dirt upon the best reformed Protestants in his next page. That Beza has been charged by the Papists for having instigated Poltrotius Meruius to assassinate the Duke of Guise is readily acknowledged. But withal we know how usual and how meritorious a thing it is with them to brand Protestants with whatsoever they can suppose will render them odious. Nor was this calumny so much fastened by them upon Beza as upon the Admiral Coligny, who was known to be a man of more virtue and honour than to allow the least accession to so base a crime. Had this vile libeller but common honesty and ingenuity, he would, at the same time he presumes to revive this calumnious accusation, have taken notice of the vindication which the Admiral published to justify his innocency. And for Buchanan, the character which Archbishop Spotswood has given of him, is enough to secure and preserve his memory from the stains which such fellows as this, or any enemies to truth and learning, could throw upon him. Nor will Calvin lose the reverence he has from good Protestants for this libeller's mercenary reproaches. For the association, which he next mentions, dropped out of the clouds, entered into, and subscribed by nobody, and seen by no one of our party that ever we could hear of, and we believe by none of yours, but those that contrived the putting it into the Earl's closet. It renders you more ridiculous and extravagant than ever ye were, to set up an abhorrence through all England of a paper which you can lay to the charge of no party, nor at one single man's door. But we doubt not, but if you had found, or put the libel your poet was cudgelled for, though few of your loyal closets, perhaps, are without that, and other libels upon the king, into the earl's closet, ye would have set up an abhorrence of that, rather than not have kept up the fermentation and division amongst the people. When this is run out of breath, we suppose ye will set up the ticket for the forbidden dinner, and ye will abhor factious, schismatical, seditious, fanatical, and rebellious dining, or some new red herring out of his lordship's kitchen will come forth. The insolence in the same page of your libeller in comparing the jury that gave in ignoramus to the bill against our noble peer, to a jury taken out of Newgate, deserves the pillory, since tis evident to the whole city they were all men of singular honesty and integrity in all their dealings, of signal good lives, of good understandings, and of great wealth, 
and in the memory of man the city has not seen a jury better qualified nor was there one dissenter amongst them to prevent your weak cavils cavils i say for it had been no objection if they had been all so since they value their oaths and consciences as much as any sort of men and have no dispensations to go against them and this clamour against the jury is because they would not believe an incredible matter from incredible witnesses who either were then or had been lately most of them papists who were far inconsistent in their testimony with one another and themselves that i am confident not one of the reverent bench believed them. If they did, they must be very shallow, and must take this law to be little better than an idiot. If ye look upon the oath of a grand juryman, ye will find that the meaning of those two words, bill la vera, is, they do believe the matter of the bill in their consciences to be true, which if they did not, they must have been perjured if they found the bill. The law provides that in capital cases a man shall not be wrongfully accused, and therefore appoints two juries, both which are bound to find according to their beliefs. And the injustice is as great, though the injury be less, for the former to accuse by indictment, if they believe the party innocent, as for the latter to hang him with the same belief. If ye had had the disposal of the juries, we doubt not but there are conspirators would have found witnesses to have sworn that most of the nobility and gentry who have been zealous and active against popery had entered into this feigned association. Heaven keep us from juries, such as will give eight hundred shillings damages to a powder monkey, without any damage to proved, for words spoken by a magistrate in rebuking the saucy fellow as if it were scandalum magnatum to abuse a Tory, though a feller of wash-balls. And from that which gave a thousand shillings to a knight for being called papist, whom it would not, perhaps, have cost a hundred shillings if he had been convicted, or five hundred shillings to a notorious varlet for being six hours detained by a messenger after notice of the dissolution of a parliament, and perhaps no legal notice neither. Our juries are zealous to preserve the innocent, and yours to ruin and destroy them. Ye see what manner of spirit it is that actuates ye, and by the fruits we can guess whether it be good or evil. It seems to us to breathe forth nothing but ruin, murder, and massacre. And for your understanding, tis sufficiently shown by your professing to believe a Protestant plot, to seize and depose the king and destroy the government, without any other circumstance proved than that of a joiner riding with a sword and pistols to Oxford, who had used to ride so armed many years before, and yet ye have the face to deny a popish plot for the destruction of the king's person and government after Coleman's letters, and the others published by the recorder, by command from the House of Commons, the murder of Sir Edmundbury Godfrey, the assassination of Mr. Arnold after a general report among the Jesuits in all foreign popish countries of the king's being dead, it seems they thought themselves cocksure. At the same time Dr. Oates swears he was to be murdered here, and a multitude of other convincing circumstances which were of that force, that there were at least ten of the king's proclamations that affirmed it. A public fast was enjoined for it, and three successive parliaments, nemine contradicente, upon a full hearing of the evidence regarding all the letters and weighing all the circumstances declared it to be a horrid conspiracy against the king's life and government what impudence or stupidity is this let the world judge now tories fare ye well apply your heads to thinking a little and do not like young whelps run away with a false scent and cry out forty-one and ignoramus and in time ye may be wiser and let your poet know that the first occasion he gives, he shall hear from us, Father. End of section three. Section four of Dryden versus Shadwell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug Dryden versus Shadwell, A Poetic Duel by John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell Section 4 The Medal of John Bayes 
or a satire upon folly and knavery by thomas shadwell how long shall i endure without reply to hear this bays this hackney railer lie the fool uncudgelled for one libel swells where not his wit but sauciness excels whilst with foul words and names which he lets fly he quite defiles the satire's dignity for libel and true satire different be this must have truth and salt with modesty sparing the persons this does tax the crimes galls not great men but vices of the times with witty and sharp not blunt and bitter rhymes methinks the ghost of horace there i see lashing this cherry-cheeked dunce of fifty-three who at that age so boldly durst profane with base hide label the free satire's vein thou stylest it satire to call names rogue whore traitor and rebel and a thousand more an oyster wrench is sure thy muse of late and all thy helicons at billingsgate a libeller's vile name then mayst thou gain and moderately the writing part maintain none can so well the beating part sustain though with thy sword thou art the last of men thou art a damned baroski with thy pen as far from satire does thy talent lie as from being cheerful or good company for thou art saturnine thou dost confess a civil word thy dullness to express an old gelt mastiff has more mirth than thou when thou a kind of paltry mirth wouldst show good humour thou so awkwardly put'st on it fits like murdish clothes upon a clown while that of gentlemen is brisk and high when wine and wit about the room does fly thou never makest but art a standing jest thy mirth by foolish bawdry is expressed and so debauched so fulsome and so odd as let's bugger one another now by god when asked how they should spend the afternoon this was a smart reply of the heroic clown he boasts of vice which he did ne'er commit calls himself whore-master and sodomite commends reeve's ass and says the buggers well and silly lies of vicious pranks does tell this is a sample of his mirth and wit which he for the best company thinks fit in a rich soil the sprightly horse you've seen run leap and wanton o'er the flowery green prance and curvet with pleasure to the sight but it could never any eyes delight to see the frisking frolics of a cow and such another merry thing art thou in verse thou hast a knack with words to chime and hadst a kind of excellence in rhyme with rhymes like leading strings thou walk'st but those laid by at every step thou brok'st thy nose how low thy farce and thy blank verse how mean how poor how naked did appear each scene even thou didst blush at thy insipid stuff and laid thy dullness on poor harmless snuff no comic scene or humour hast thou wrought thou'st quibbling bawdry and ill-breeding taught but rhyme's sad downfall has thy ruin brought no peace did ever from thyself begin thou canst no web from thine own bowels spin were from thy works culled out what thou'st purloined even durf you would excel what's left behind should all thy borrowed plumes we from thee tear how truly poet squab wouldst thou appear thou call'st thyself and fools call thee in rhyme the goodly prince of poets of thy time and sovereign power thou dost usurp john bays and from all poets thou a tax dost raise thou plunderest all to advance thy mighty name look'st big and triumphs with thy borrowed fame but art while swelling thus thou think'st thou chief a servile imitator and a thief all written wit thou seizest on as prize but that will not thy ravenous mind suffice though men from thee their inward thoughts conceal yet thou the words out of their mouths wilt steal how little owe we to your native store who all you write have heard or read before except your libels and there's something new for none were e'er so impudent as you
Some scoundrel poetasters yet there be, Fools that burlesque the name of loyalty, Who by reviling patriots think to be From losiness and hunger ever free, But will, for all their hopes of swelling bags, Return to primitive nastiness and rags. These are blind fools, thou hadst some kind of fight, Thou since against thy conscience and the light. After the drubs thou didst of late compound, Unfold for the weight in gold each bruise and wound, Clear was thy fight, and none declaimed then more Against popish plots and arbitrary power. The ministers thou bluntly wouldst assail, And it was dangerous to hear thee rail. O oh, may not England's stupid be like thee, Heaven grant it may not feel before its sea. Now he recants, and on that beating thrives, Thus poet laureates and Russian wives Do strangely upon beating mend their lives. But how comes Bayes to flag and grovel so? Sure your new lords are in their payments slow, Thou deserv'st whipping, thou'rt so dull this time, Thou'st turned the observator into rhyme. But thou suppliest the want of wit and sense With most malicious lies and impudence. At Cambridge first your scurrilous vein began, When saucily you traduced a noble man, Who for that crime rebuked you on the head, And you had been expelled had you not fled. The next step of advancement you began Was being clerk to Knowles Lord Chamberlain, A sequestrator and committee man. There all your wholesome morals you sucked in, And got your gentile gaiety and mien. Your loyalty you learned in Cromwell's court, where first your muse did make her great effort, On him you first showed your poetic strain, And praised his opening the basilisk vein. And were that possible to come again, Thou on that side wouldst draw thy slavish pen. But he being dead, who should the slave prefer? He turned a journeyman, ta bookseller, Writ prefaces to books for meat and drink, And as he paid he would both write and think, then by the assistance of a noble knight Thou hadst plenty, ease and liberty to write. First like a gentleman he made thee live, And on his bounty thou didst amply thrive. But soon thy native swelling venom rose, And thou didst him who gave thee bread expose. Gainst him a scandalous preface didst thou write, Which thou didst soon expunge rather than fight, When turned away by him in some small time. You and the people's ears began to chime, And please the town with your successful rhyme, When the best patroness of wit and stage, The joy, the pride, the wonder of the age, Sweet Annabel, the good, great, witty, fair, Of all this northern court, the brightest star, Did on thee, Bays, her sacred beams dispense, Who could do ill under such influence? She, the whole court, brought over to thy side, and favour flowed upon thee like a tide. To her thou soon proofst an ungrateful knave. So good was she, not only she forgave, But did oblige anew the faithless slave. And all the gratitude he can afford Is basely to traduce her princely lord. A hero worthy of a godlike race, Great in his mind and charming in his face, Who conquers hearts with unaffected grace, his mighty virtues are too large for verse, Gentle as billing doves, as angry lions fierce. His strength and beauty so united are, Nature designed him chief in love and war, All lovers' victories he did excel, Succeeding with the beauteous Annabel. Early in arms his glorious course began, Which never hero yet so swiftly ran, Wherever danger showed his dreadful face, By never-dying act, he adorned his royal race. Sure the three Edward's souls beheld with joy, How much thou outdidst man when little more than boy. And all the princely heroes of thy line Rejoiced to see so much of their great blood in thine. So good and so diffusive is his mind, So loving too, and loved by humane kind, He was for vast and general good designed. In height of greatness he all eyes did glad, And never man departed from him sad. Sweet and obliging, easy of access, Wise in his judging, courteous in address. 
O'er all the passions he bears so much sway, No stoic taught him better to obey, And in his suffering part he shines more bright Than he appeared in all that gaudy light. Now, now, methinks he makes the bravest show, And ne'er was greater hero than he's now. For public good, who wealth and power forsakes, Over himself a glorious conquest makes. Religion, prince, and laws to him are dear, and in defence of all he dares appear. Tis he must stand like Sceva in the breach, Gainst what ill ministers do, and furious parsons preach. Were it not for him, how soon some popish knife Might rob us of his royal father's life. We to their fear of thee that blessing owe, In such a son, happy great king, art thou, Who can defend, or can revenge thee so. Next for thy medal, Bays, which does revile The wisest patriot of our drooping isle, Who loyally did serve his exiled prince, And with the ablest counsel blessed him since, No more than he did stop tyrannic power, Or in that crisis did contribute more To his just rights our monarch to restore, And still by wise advice and loyal arts Would have secured him in his subjects' hearts. You own the mischiefs sprung from that intrigue Which fatally dissolved the Triple League. Each of your idle mock triumvirate knows. Our patriots strongly did that breach oppose, Nor did this lord a Dover journey go, From thence our tears the ilium of our woe. Had he that interest followed, How could he by those that served it then discarded be? The French and Papists well his merits know, were he a friend, they'd not pursued him so. From both he would our beset king preserve, For which he does eternal wreaths deserve. His life they first, and now his fame would take, For crimes they forge, and secret plots they make. They by hired witnesses the first pursue, The latter by vile scribblers hired like you. Thy infamy will blush at no disgrace, With such a hardened conscience and a face, Thou only want'st an evidence's place. When the isle was drowned in lethargic sleep, Our vigilant hero still a watch did keep, When all our strength should have been made a prey To the lewd Babylonian Delilah. Methinks I see our watchful hero stand, Jogging the nodding genius of our land which sometimes struggling with sleep's heavy yoke, awaked, stared, and looked grim, and dreadfully he spoke. The voice filled all the land, and then did fright the scarlet whore from all her works of night. But, with unseen strength at home and foreign aid, too soon she rallied and began to invade, and many nets she spread and many toils she laid to lull us yet asleep, what pain she takes, but all in vain, for still our genius wakes, and now remembers well the dangerous test, which might have all our liberty oppressed, had not the covered snare our hero found, and for some time bravely maintained the ground, till others saw the bondage was designed, and late with them their straggling forces joined. A bill then drawn by bays did we see, a zealous bill against for popery. Then murdered Godfrey a loved prince's blood, ready with precious drops to make a purple flood, when popish tyranny shall give command, and spread again its darkness o'er the land. Then bloody plots we find laid at their door, than whom none e'er have done or suffered more, or would to save the prince they did restore. Amidst these hellish snares tis time to wake, May never more asleep our genius take. These things did soon our glorious city warm, And for their own and prince's safety arm. The joy of ours, terror of other lands, With moderate head, with unpolluted hands, To which the prince and people safety owe, From which the uncorrupted streams of justice flow. Through thickest clouds of perjury you see, And ne'er by hackney oaths deceived will be, Resolved to value credibility. Thou vindicatest the justice of thy prince, Which shines most bright by clearing innocence, While some would subjects of their lives bereave, By witnesses themselves could ne'er believe, 
Though wrongly accused, yet at their blood they aim, And as they were their quarry, think it shame Not to run down, and seize the trembling game. Thy justice will hereafter be renowned, Thy lasting name for loyalty be crowned. When twill be told who did our prince restore, Whom thou with zeal did ever since adore, how oft hast thou his princely wants supplied, And never was thy needful aid denied, How long his kindness with thy duty strove, Great thy obedience, and as great his love, And cursed be they who would his heart remove, Thou, still the same, with equal zeal wilt serve, Maintain his laws, his person wilt preserve. But some foul monsters thy rich womb does bear, that like base vipers would thy bowels tear, Who would thy ancient charters give away, And all thy stronger liberties betray. Those elder customs our great ancestors Have from the Saxon times conveyed to ours, Of which no personal crimes a loss can cause, By Magna Carta backed, and by succeeding laws. This is a factious brood we should pursue, for as in schism, so in sedition too, The many are deserted by the few. These factious few, for bitter scourges fit, To show a dressing and abhorring wit, Set up a jack of lent and throw at it. But those, alas, false silly measures take, Who of the few an association make, Thou needst not doubt to triumph o'er these fools, These blindly led, these Jesuited tools. Whilst bravely thou continuest to oppose, All would be papists, as all Romish foes. In spite of lawless men and popish flames, Enriched by thy much-loved and bounteous Thames, May into thee the wealth of nations flow, And to thy height all Europe's cities bow. Thou great support of princely dignity, And bulwark to the people's liberty, if a good mayor with such good shreves appear, Nor prince nor people need a danger fear. And such we hope for each succeeding year. Thus thou a glorious city mayst remain, And all thy ancient liberties retain, While Albion is surrounded with the main. Go, abject bays, and act thy slavish part, Fawn on those popish knaves whose knave thou art. Tis not ill writing or worse policy that can enslave a nation so long free. Our king's too good to take that rugged course. He'll win by kindness, not subdue by force. If king of slaves and beasts, not men he'd be, a lion were a greater prince than he. Approach him then, let no malicious chit, no insolent praetor, nor a flashy wit, impeachments make not men for statesmen's fit. But truth, judgment, firmness, and integrity, with long experience, quick sagacity, swift to prevent, as ready to foresee, knowing the depths from which all action springs, and by a chain of causes judging things, that does all weights into the balance cast, and wisely can foretell the future by the past, where e'er such virtuous qualities appear, their patriots worthy of a prince's ear, To him and subjects they'll alike be dear. The king's and people's interest thou make one, What personal greatness can our monarch own, When hearts of subjects must support the throne? A minister should strive those hearts to unite, Unless they had a mind to make us fight, Who by addresses thus the realm divide, All bonds of kindred and of friends untied, Have in effect in battle ranged each side, but heaven avert those plagues which we deserve, intestine jars, but popish ends can serve. How false and dangerous methods do they take, who would a king but of addresses make? They from protection would throw all the rest, and poorly narrow the king's interest, to make their little party too seem great, they with false musters like the Spaniards cheat. He's king of all, and would have all their hearts, Were it not for these dividing popish arts. Statesman, who his true interest would improve, Compute his greatness by his people's love, That may assist our friends and foes o'ercome, So much he will be feared abroad as loved at home. He at the people's head may great appear, As the Edwards, 
Henry's and Eliza were, and cursed be they who would that power divide, who would dissolve that sacred knot by which they're tied. Those miscreants who hate a parliament would soon destroy our ancient government. Those slaves would make us fit to be or come, and gladly sell the land to France or Rome. But heaven preserve our legal monarchy, and all those laws that keep the people free. Of all mankind, for ever cursed be they, who would or kings or people's rights betray, or aught would change but by a legislative way. Be damned the most abhorred and traitorous race, who would the best of governments deface. Now farewell, wretched mercenary bays, who the king libelled and did Cromwell praise. Farewell, abandoned rascal, only fit to be abused by thy own scurrilous wit, which thou wouldst do, and for a moderate sum, answer thy medal and thy Absalom. Thy piteous hackney pen shall never fright us, thou dwindle down to Hodge and Heraclitus. Go, ignoramus cry, and forty-one, and by some passons be thou praised alone, pied thing, half wit, half fool, and for a knave few men than this a better mixture have, but thou canst add to that, coward and slave. Finis End of section four. Section five of Dryden versus Shadwell, a poetic duel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. Dryden versus Shadwell, a poetic duel by John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell. Macflecno by John Dryden. All human things are subject to decay, and when fate summons, monarchs must obey. This Flecno found, who like Augustus, young was called to empire, and had governed long. In prose and verse was owned without dispute through all the realms of nonsense, absolute. This aged prince, now flourishing in peace, and blessed with issue of a large increase, worn out with business did at length debate to settle the succession of the state and pondering which of all his sons was fit to reign and wage immortal war with wit cried it is resolved for nature pleads that he should only rule who most resembles me alone my perfect image bears mature in dullness from his tender years Shine alone of all my sons is he who stands confirmed in full stupidity the rest to some faint meaning make pretence but sh never deviates into sense some beams of wit on other souls may fall strike through and make a lucid interval but charles genuine night admits no ray his rising fogs prevail upon the day besides his goodly fabric fills the eye and seems designed for thoughtless majesty thoughtless as monarch oaks that shade the plain and spread in solemn state supinely reign hayward and shirley were but types of thee thou last great prophet of tautology 
even i a dunce of more renown than they was sent before but to prepare thy way and coarsely clad in nourish drugget came to teach the nations in thy greater name my warbling lute the lute i whilom strung when to king john of portugal i sung was but the prelude to that glorious day when thou on silver thames didst cut thy way with well-timed oars before the royal barge swelled with the pride of thy celestial charge and big with him commander of an host the like was ne'er in epsom blankets tossed methinks i see the new arion sail the lute still trembling underneath thy nail at thy well-sharpened thumb from shore to shore the treble squeaks for fear the bases roar echoes from pissing alley sh call and shower they resound from aston hall about thy boat the little fishes throng as at the morning toast that floats along sometimes as prince of thy harmonious band thou wield'st thy papers in thy threshing hand st andre's feet ne'er kept more equal time not even the feet of thy own psyche's rhyme though they in number as in sense excel so just so like tautology they fell that pale with envy singleton forswore the lute and sword which he in triumph bore and vowed he ne'er would act valerius more <sighs> here stopped the good old sire and wept for joy in silent raptures of the hopeful boy all arguments but most his plays persuade that for anointed dullness he was made close to the walls which fair augusta bind the fair augusta much to fears inclined an ancient fabric raised to inform the site there stood of yore and barbican it hight a watch-tower once but now so fate ordains of all the pile an empty name remains from its old ruins brothel houses rise scenes of lewd loves and of polluted joys where their vast courts the mother strumpets keep and undisturbed by watch in silence sleep near these a nursery erects its head where queens are formed and future heroes bred where unfledged actors learn to laugh and cry where infant punks their tender voices try and little maximins the gods defy great fletcher never treads in buskins here nor greater johnson dares in socks appear but gentle simkin just reception finds amidst this monument of vanished minds pure clinches the suburban muse affords and panton waging harmless war with words here flecno as a place to fame well known ambitiously designed his throne for ancient decker prophesied long since that in this pile should reign a mighty prince 
born for a scourge of wit and flail of sense to whom true dullness should some psyches owe but worlds of misers from his pen should flow humorists and hypocrites it should produce whole raymond families and tribes of bruce now empress fame had published the renown of shum's coronation through the town roused by report of fame the nations meet from near bun hill and distant watling street no persian carpet spread the imperial way but scattered limbs of mangled poets lay from dusty shops neglected authors come martyrs of pies and relics of the bum much hayward shirley ogleby there lay but loads of sh almost choked the way bilked stationers for yeomen stood prepared and herringman was captain of the guard the hoary prince in majesty appeared high on a throne of his own labours reared at his right hand our young ascanius sat rome's other hope and pillar of the state his brows thick fogs instead of glory's grace and lambent dullness played around his face as hannibal did to the altars come sworn by his sire a mortal foe to rome so swore nor should his vow be vain that he till death true dullness would maintain and in his father's right and realm's defence ne'er to have peace with wit nor truce with sense the king himself the sacred unction made as king by office and as priest by trade in his sinister hand instead of ball he placed a mighty mug of potent ale love's kingdom to his right he did convey at once his sceptre and his rule of sway whose righteous law the prince had practised young and from whose loins recorded psyche sprung his temples last with poppies were o'erspread that nodding seemed to consecrate his head just at that point of time if fame not lie on his left hand twelve reverend owls did fly so romulus tis sung by tiber's brook presage of sway from twice six vultures took the admiring throng loud acclamations make and omens of his future empire take the sire then shook the honours of his head and from his brows damps of oblivion shed full on the filial dullness long he stood repelling from his breast the raging god at length passed out in this prophetic mood <coughs> heavens bless my son from ireland let him reign to far barbados on the western main of his dominion may no end be known and greater than his father's be his throne beyond love's kingdom let him stretch his pen he paused and all the people cried amen then thus continued he 
my son advance still in new impudence new ignorance success let other teach learn thou from me pangs without birth and fruitless industry let virtuosos in five years be writ yet not one thought accuse thy toil of wit let gentle george in triumph tread the stage make dorimant betray and love it rage let cully cockwood fopling charm the pit and in their folly show the writer's wit yet still thy fools shall stand in thy defence and justify their author's want of sense let em be all by thy own model made of dullness and desire no foreign aid that they to future ages may be known not copies drawn but issue of thy own nay let thy men of wit too be the same all full of thee and differing but in name but let no alien sedley interpose to lard with wit thy hungry epsom prose and when false flowers of rhetoric thou wouldst cull trust nature do not labour to be dull but write thy best and top and in each line sir formal's oratory will be thine sir formal though unsought attends thy quill and does thy northern dedications fill nor let false friends seduce thy mind to fame by arrogating johnson's hostile name let father flecno fire thy mind with praise and uncle ogleby thy envy raise thou art my blood where johnson has no part what share have we in nature or in art where did his wit on learning fix a brand and rail at arts he did not understand where made he love in prince nicander's vein or swept the dust in psyche's humble strain where sold he bargains whip-stitch kiss me ass promised a play and dwindled to a farce when did his muse from fletcher scenes purloin as thou whole etheridge dost transfuse to thine but so transfused as oil on waters flow his always floats above thine sinks below this is thy province this thy wondrous way new humours to invent for each new play this is that boasted bias of thy mind by which one way to dullness tis inclined which makes thy writings lean on one side still and in all changes that way bends thy will nor let thy mountain belly make pretence of likeness thine's a timpany of sense a ton of man in thy large bulk is writ but sure thou'rt but a kilderkin of wit like mine thy gentle numbers feebly creep thy tragic muse gives smiles thy comic sleep with whate'er gall thou set'st thyself to write thy inoffensive satires never bite in thy felonious heart though venom lies 
it does but touch thy irish pen and buys thy genius calls thee not to purchase fame in keen iambics but mild anagram leave writing plays and choose for thy command some peaceful province in acrostic land there thou mayst wings display and altars raise and torture one poor word ten thousand ways or if thou wouldst thy different talent suit set thy own songs and sing them to thy lute he said but his last words were scarcely heard for bruce and longville had a trap prepared and down they sent the yet declaiming bard sinking he left his drugget robe behind borne upwards by a subterranean wind the mantle fell to the young prophet's part with double portion of his father's art End of MacFleckno by John Dryden. Read by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. End of Dryden versus Shadwell, a poetic duel by John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell.